We are going to be talking about parenting today, and it really is a privilege. I recognize not everybody in the room is a parent, uh, but we're all kids of somebody. And so I hope that even we have something to take out of it today. I hope that uh, as a parent, you can maybe uh, take this time to reflect on sort of the big picture of parenting. If you're a kid, uh, I'm going to admit that us parents do it wrong all the time, but hopefully you here today that there is a right way to do it and that it's what God wants for you. And hopefully when I talk about having grace and forgiveness, uh, you're going to know that you're going to need to give that to your parents too. Uh, I want to say off the bat too as well, uh, as this, this is a kid's service, if your kids start to, to squirm uh, or wiggle, that's totally fine. This is what the early church used to do. They used to gather in homes and worship together, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, so don't feel stressed out. If, you, if it's really stressing you out, of course, the nursery and parenting room is available for you and services playing in there, but there is no obligation to leave. If it bugs you uh, that kids are in the room, you can go out and listen out there too. Uh, so I'm just going to put that as a disclaimer. Now, kids, uh, to keep you engaged, because I'm mostly talking to the parents in the room, I want to invite you to a challenge into the potential to win at a draw. Uh, right here in front of me and at the back of the room, there's some paper, some crayons in the back of the seats, there's pens. If you want to draw something that I talk about today, and do your best effort and put your name on it. At the end of service, you can leave it, and we will pick randomly one drawing, which next Sunday when you come back, you'll get a gift card to go out and do like a family date night for you and your family. So if you wanna do that, go to the back of the room, grab paper crayons right now, run up here really quick, grab paper and crayons, and then at the end of the service, we'll collect them all from you. I love it. The chaos is so good. Good, good. And you have to put in effort. If there's no effort in it, I'm putting it in the recycle bin. Uh, but if it looks good, it is all going on Mr. Mikey's fridge at home. So, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Bethany. Um, but today I want us to look at sort of the big picture of parenting sort of what the vision is in terms of what scripture has to say about what it means as a follower of Jesus to parent. Uh, and you know, I think that's sometimes a difficult thing to keep in view. I think so often as we parent, uh, it's hard to remember what we're trying to do. I mean, I'm talking about beyond like keeping your child alive. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, when they're little, there's that first part where you have to actually keep them alive. And then the rest of the time, you're trying to keep them from killing themselves as they go along and doing something wild and crazy. And, and it, there's just so much to do as a parent, right? We got to feed our kids, keep them dry when they're young as they get bigger and busier. We have to help them manage their schedules, find jobs, go out. Eventually, when they get a little older, maybe figure out relationships and their, themselves. Hopefully, we have some wisdom if they become parents to pass on to them. And, and this thing of parenting just keeps on going. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, we're always striving to kind of figure out what to do. But the problem is that even if we succeed in putting the right clothes on them that fit, getting them out the door well fed, getting them to their sports on time, we can still fail at the most important things that we're called to do. If we don't focus on what's most important in parenting, the chances we're going to wander off course and sort of get lost in the woods and we're going to miss arriving at the goal of parenting. Now again, uh, this is something that, 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 that weighs heavy for all of us, and we all as, as parents know that we try our best and, and fall apart. And so what I don't want you to hear today is this sort of beating you. This isn't meant to sort of lambaste and tell you where you're failing. This is something to call you to. There's this beautiful picture that happens right in the beginning of Scripture when God lays out a plan for his people where he calls us to something. 
God doesn't say, hey, look at you, bunch of failures in your generations of raising kids. He says, hey, look at you, my people. Let me call you into something bigger. If you have a Bible, you can join me in Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, again, we're getting this instruction from the Lord. And we're getting this picture for his people. For all of those of us who come after of, of what our life is to be for and live towards. And here we see actually that parenting is a work of worship. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 we hear these famous words. Hear O Israel or we could hear hear O church. The Lord our God the Lord is one. Love the Lord with your God with all your heart with all your soul with all your strength. We're familiar with this. Jesus taught this later. This is what the first and greatest commandment is that everything else hangs on to. He said, these commandments that I'm giving you today are to be on your heart, but not just on your heart. Listen to what comes next. Verse 70 says, I want you to impress them on your children too. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands, bind them on your foreheads, write them on your door frames and on your gates. Deuteronomy is this picture of God's law and right here within it as he tells us to love the Lord, he says, I want you to love some other people too. If you have kids in your journey of life, this is what I want you to to do. I want you to make your worship of me incorporate your whole family. I want you to take what you're learning, what you're wrestling through, and I want you to pass that on to the next generation. Part of our call as Christians who are parents is to continue the faith by diligently teaching about who God is and what he means to us. And it's not just here, it's all through scripture. It's Proverbs 22. Start children off in the way they should go, so even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Ephesians 6. Fathers, don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. This isn't even just in commandments like we, I've just read three of. It's also through the narrative of scripture continuously. We often see these moments where parents are called to something, which is to love their kids and teach them to love the Lord. In Jesus' great commission, he tells people, go out into all the world and baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. As we go out into the whole world, we first have to stop at our threshold of our home and make sure that we've started in the place where our kids are. So I want to ask you this, what is the purpose of your parenting? As you think about what you're doing, as you walk alongside these one or more tiny humans as a parent, you ask yourself, what am I going to do each day? Where am I trying to get these kids to go How am I trying to get them to go? Parenting has to be about more than just keeping people alive. What are we keeping them alive for? Well, if we trust in what scripture says, it's we're keeping them alive for and training them up to be alive as the image of God that he has designed them to be. And we're striving to help them cultivate their faith So that they can become the people that God has called them to be as they love and follow him. And that starts right from the womb. And it carries on until we pass or children pass. That's our call. What we're called into. And this is really weighty when you don't just think about what is going on today. But when you think about this in light of eternity. One day... Every single person in this room is going to have to stand before King Jesus and give an account for their life. And I think as a a parent, it's not just an account for your life, but an account for 
the integrity in which you stewarded your children's lives too. What decisions your kids make aren't on you, but whether or not you were faithful to the call is a question that we all have to wrestle through. The reality is when God looks at us and looks at our children, he doesn't care about how many sports games they participated in. He doesn't care if we even got them on time to school. It's not going to matter if they got an academic scholarship or if your kid's really good at playing the flute. It doesn't matter if your kid had good social status at all. It doesn't matter if they had clothes to fit into. What matters is their relationship with Jesus. That's what Jesus will hold them to. And I believe that's what he's going to hold us to as well as parents. Are you parenting in such a way that your kids would know that's the ultimate goal? Are you parenting in such a way that you remember consistently that that's your call? Thankfully, there's not just this blanket statement, hey, church, hey, my people, this is what I want you to do. But he, God goes from there and he gives us this picture of how we can live into that. We see right there in Deuteronomy, it says what he wants us to do is when is to take the commandments that God has given us and impress them on our children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Physically portray it to your children. Tie it as symbols on your hands and bind it on your forehead. Write the word and commands of God on your door frames of your houses and on your gates too. I think one of the most essential things we can do as parents is to make regular occurrences happen when our children will bump in to the Word of God and into His teaching. It begins by starting our day and ending our day when our kids are at home by reminding them that God is in the room and that He'll be with them through everything they go into. It's a reminder when our kids move out of the house that when we have opportunity to have a phone call or have them over into our home or when we just see them or drop them a note to ask them and engage with them about what God wants them to know. And this will look different in different stages. Some of us who will have kids who will grow up and, and they really easily accept the Lord and his commands and that's going to flow. But even not if they go the other way or if they're struggling to wrestle through our call is to love them and to do what we can to impress this on their hearts i want you to just quickly ask yourself internally or you can look at your spouse if you have one and just say do i regularly or do we regularly incorporate this in to our day you know our interactions with our kids when they come over for sunday evening dinner when we drop them a note for Christmas. What's your pattern of making this come true? For some families, the best thing that you can do is have your Bible open up on your dinner table and, and read a verse or two. For others, maybe it's taking time to stop and pray in the morning before your kid goes to school or when they're tucking, getting tucked into bed. And sometimes it's having an opportunity to do it somewhere else if they're not into those times? Do you have an opportunity where maybe you can have devotionals where you do it with your kids? Or maybe if you, your kids aren't in a stage where they're willing to do it with you, but just where you can allow them to see you taking your faith seriously. Do take opportunity, right? It talks about when we walk to and from the places we go. There's opportunities there. We can listen to worship music. That's one of my favorite things. My girls love singing worship music, and so we try to pick the song that's the loudest and, 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 and shoutiest songs, and we crank it up as far as I can go, and we belt it out. And yes, my ears ring, but my heart rings full when I hear my kids worshiping Jesus. Now, if you're already doing some of these things, the question that you need to do is, is ask, what can, else can I do? You know, one of the things that I think that we often stop at is just this programmatic list of things to do. 
It can be, okay, we're going to pray and say grace at the dinner table. We're going to pray at the end of the night. Maybe we're going to buy our kids Bibles and devotionals. And, and we leave it there. And, and we constantly come to them with instruction to. Let me tell you what you should do. Here's what I would do in that situation. But there's often a missing piece, which I think is what we need to bring in as we think about what's said in Deuteronomy 6. And that's inviting our kids into what God is doing in our life. Notice the first part of that command. Hear, O Israel, about the Lord your God, the Lord that you're supposed to give your heart, your mind, and your strength to. There's this personal relationship that happens first. Do we actually invite our kids into that? Or do we tell our kids about what they should do? Do we show our kids how we're learning and wrestling through God's commands? Do we actually tell them about how God has made it a meaningful impact on our day? And honestly, that's sometimes all you can do. You're never going to be able to force your kid to read the Bible. You're never going to be able to make your kid pray. You're never going to be able to send your kid to youth group or when they leave the home, make sure they get to church on a Sunday morning. All that you're going to be able to do is love the Lord your God with all of you and do your best to share it with them. Is this an intentional part of what you're going to do? I'd encourage you that it's one of the most meaningful things that you could ever do. I'll never forget a young woman that I got to pastor at my last church. I got to walk alongside of her for five and a half years. She was one of my core students. I poured into her and and gave the best messages and Bible study talks, and I tried to help her be involved in leadership. And one of the greatest parts of and greatest joys for me was that when I asked her, why is Jesus real to you, was the fact that she didn't look at me as her youth pastor and said, it's because of you. What she actually said to me is, you know why my faith is real? Because every morning I walk downstairs and my dad sits at the kitchen island reading his Bible. Now, if you knew her dad, he's an incredibly busy commodities trader. He is a CEO of a business. He's got a bunch of kids who he's trying to raise. And this guy had every reason to be busy first thing in the morning. But daily... He was diligent, even after the trading window had opened, to sit at his kitchen island and to read scripture so his kids would see that this was meaningful too. And the thing that made his daughter realize who God is and what he could be and how he could be worth more than money and business and and family and work and school was the fact that she saw him putting God first. In an unspoken way, she showed the command that Jesus was calling him to, to raise up his kids to see that this is really what life is all about. So I would encourage you to think of One or two ways today that you can incorporate God more throughout the day. Maybe one way that's intentional and one way maybe it's passive where your kids are just going to bump into experiencing what Jesus means to you and what he could mean to them. Now for all the kids in the room, I want you to know whether or not your parents get this right, this is what they're supposed to do. God's love for you, for all of us, will far exceed what our parents can do. God is so good that he wanted you to experience everything that he had in store for you so he didn't leave it up to your parents because your parents will screw it up and they're not going to get this perfect and they're not going to reflect Jesus well all the time and that's why he sent Jesus to you and to all of us. Parents are people, which means they'll let you down. But fortunately, beyond our parents, we also have the good, good father we sang about in that song. Jesus came not to just show us who God is, but to make a way for us to come into relationship with us. Jesus didn't just live, but he died on the cross for me and you. 
so that all of our sin, all the things we do wrong, could be wiped away if we put our trust in him. And so whether or not your parents ever tell you that, you need to know that's true. And it's the greatest thing that can change your life forever. And it's the best joy that if your parents don't know, they'll never see. Is knowing what it's like to be in a relationship with Jesus. Where he says he loves you and where he cares for you and he shows you what a perfect parent really can be. Parents, we want our kids to know that message. We need to live that out. One of the ways that we can do that in addition to maybe dropping in on conversation about how God is being meaningful to me or beyond reading the Bible or praying with our kids is to hold the tension between law and grace. God showed us the perfect example in himself as Jesus. God gave us the law, the things that we ought to do if we were to live in perfect perfection. And he gave us himself because he knew we could never keep up to that standard. I think oftentimes in parenting, we can lean too far one way or the other. If our parenting is supposed to represent Jesus, we need to represent him by holding in tension the things we've got to do. Think about it this way. A kid can eat way too much junk food, but never giving it to them probably teaches them never to learn how to have moderation in their life. In the same way, we can give our kids such, such a strict rule and such a strict boundary, and we can live with that in such a way that they begin to resent who we are and what we stand for. Now, it's not to say that we don't need that. Our kids need to find boundaries. They need to know what's right from wrong. But as they bump into that line, do we act like Jesus would when we bump into the line of his law? We mess up time and time again, and every single time God says, I'm willing to forgive you. I'm willing to stick with you through the mess you've made. And I'm going to work, and thankfully because he's perfect, to make whatever good can come out of that come true. Do we exhibit that as parents? When our kids bump up against our law or the law, do we come alongside or do we stick it to them, and give them the screws. I think depending on how we grew up, we might go to one side or the other when we're thinking about a balancing act. Maybe you grew up in a household where things were super hard and your parents were super mean, and so you say, hey, we're just going to go all on grace. That's not going to help your kids. That's not going to show them the reality of the world and what God needs. Because God's created rules, he's created ways, he's created lines, and he says, this is what it means to follow me. And so our kids need to see that modeled in our home. But conversely, we can also lead as parents in such a way that we have so many rules and not enough grace that our kids begin to run away. And I don't blame them. I actually don't blame them because it doesn't reflect the model that Christ gave. The model that Christ gave is very, very different. Paul Tripp writes in his book on parenting, if rules and regulations had the power to change the heart and life of your child, rescuing your child from himself and giving him a heart and submission of faith, well, Jesus would have never needed to come. Jesus never needed to come if rules were the solution. But grace is. We need to use everyday moments where a child will break the rules to show forgiveness and grace. To use it as an opportunity to say, hey, I'm not perfect either. But I'm thankful there is one who is. The forgiveness of God 
rings strongly true in the moments where we are most feeble. Are we willing to allow our kids to see that as we bring them up and as we go about living through? For those of you who are older, you might be saying, well, my kids aren't in my house anymore. There's not really a whole lot I can do about the parenting that I had over them. And I want to tell you that that's just not true. For as long as you have breath in your lungs, for as long as you call yourself a follower of Jesus, there's this command. That you are supposed to love the Lord your God with all your heart and do your best to show them who he is. For some of us, it might actually mean that we need to go back to our kids and apologize. Whether or not your kids are in the home, that's probably one of the most powerful things you can do. I hate doing it, but I have to do it often. But it's amazing the power that it has in the room with my children when I have the opportunity to do that. When I can say, hey, you know what, I'm just really also thankful that God forgave me of this thing I did where I went wrong with you. Now I want to show you the very same thing, what God has shown to me. Again, kids, this is the thing that you need to understand is that your parents are trying to show you what's right and wrong. And if they're followers of Jesus, they're trying to help you see him through all of this, uh, through the rules they give you, through the way they parent you. And again, they're going to screw up. And they're going to give you an improper view of who God is and who you are. And they're going to try their best. I'm not saying go home and beat up your parents because they've screwed you up. Uh, I'm not saying don't talk to your parents when things have gone wrong, but know that if you want to see the truth, you have to go to God first. God wants to speak to you and allow you to receive this truth. Finally, let me conclude with a, a note of, maybe two notes of encouragement. One is that you have enough. As parents, it can be this incredible weight of considering how we help raise our kids. And we look at ourselves and we say, there's no way I can do that. There's no way my spouse and I can get this right. And you know what? While that's true, that you are not enough, we have enough. While we're not good enough on our own, well, we'll never parent good enough. Well, we'll never be smart enough, strong enough, kind enough, disciplined enough. Well, we'll never be able to really give a child everything that they need. We don't do it alone. We have the God who loves us, who joins us in this effort, and really is the one who makes all the fruit come to bear in their lives. Remember a, a, a second ago, I read from Ephesians chapter 6, where it said, Hey, dads, don't exasperate your kids. Which, if you're a dad, you know you've exasperated your kids. But afterwards, it says, bring up your kids in instruction and in living with the Lord. That actually comes after something else, which I believe we're supposed to see it through. Earlier in Ephesians, in chapter 3, verse 20 to 21, the apostle Paul writes this. He says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. When I read that, I am reminded that God can go far beyond what you or I can do and that he plans to bring himself glory through every single generation. And so he's got parenting to do. And he partners with us, and he does it in spite of us, and he joins us in our efforts, and even when we screw up, he works together all the things for good for those who love him. So while we'll fail again and again, God will bring grace again and again. While we'll wish more and more for our kids and not be able to bring it to fruition, God will be there to provide them exactly what they need. Sometimes we think about the verses that we read in the, the Sermon on the Mount where God will provide for even the ravens of the sky and he'll decorate the fields with flowers and that's supposed to calm us in our anxiety. 
we need to remember that that's not just true for you, but for me. It's true for our kids too. God will provide abundantly for everything they need. We just get invited into being a part of what he wants to do. If you don't do it regularly, I suggest that you go to God in prayer every single day. There's a promise that God has for us that we read in the book of James that whenever we ask him for wisdom, he will give it to us. He doesn't ask us why or how much we need. He gives us precisely what we need to get through. So as you face difficulties and challenge, perhaps you feel frustrated and like a failure as a parent, perhaps you just have no idea what to do. God is there. He's with you. He loves you. He placed you with the kids he wanted you to raise, and he will continue to bring the fruit. And on that note of fruit, let me remind you, it's not in your timing, but it's in his. That's hard to hear as parents because our kids are so meaningful to us and we want something for every single one of our kids. We know them, we love them, we want them to succeed. If we're followers of Jesus, we want them to believe, we want them to know, we want them to grow, we want them to experience that fruit of the spirit that we see that comes from following Jesus. And it's really, really frustrating that it doesn't come on our schedule. But we're told that it is God who is the one who tends to the harvest. It's God who's the one who causes the fruit to grow. If we use the image that we have in scripture, God is the vine. We are the branches. He's the source of the light and life and fruit. So while it's our job to plant seeds in our kids' hearts, while it's our job to water them to grow, it's God's job to take care of everything else and cause it to grow. And for some of us, that's going to take a lot longer than we like. Some of us might never actually see the fruit that grows in our life. But we can be thankful that God knows and that God grows. I think a lot of my grandfather, who on his deathbed finally prayed to receive Jesus. His parents had long passed. He'd lived a life long, far away from God. But what was prayed over him as his mother raised him decades and decades before came to grow. And while she never got to see on this side of eternity, I believe that there was opportunity for her to see the fruit that did grow. And so I want to encourage you to trust in Jesus. Trust in him to grow the fruit. Trust in him to support the work that you do. And as you wrestle day in and day out with what it means to be a parent, just love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And then really do put your trust in him to let him make everything else grow. In just a moment, we're going to watch a video that tells the story of what God can do in a time of parenting where we cannot do anything. Uh, but before we do that, kids, I'm going to dismiss all the younger kids, uh, grade five and under. And if you're an older kid who might be sensitive, maybe, uh, to some, some stuff that, that gets pretty heavy, I'd encourage you just to go with Mr. Mikey and Miss Amy and Mr. Greg down to the gym. And uh, there's going to be a game for you to play there. Parents, uh, if you got an older kid too, we're about to watch a video that deals with some heavy mental health stuff and, and references some, some suicidal ideation. So I just want to give you that warning. If you need to step out or you want to pull your youth out too, you can feel free to go. But I really want us to watch this video because oftentimes as parents, we can feel so helpless. We can feel so lost, and, and sometimes it's hard to see God through that. And this story just paints an incredible picture of how God can meet us in the darkest of circumstances. And so what we're going to do is we're going to watch this, and then we're just going to sit for a moment in silence. 
And I want you to just pray for your kids if you have them. If you don't have kids, pray for someone else's kids. Whether things are easy right now or hard, we all need that together. And we're just going to leave that to the Lord. And then I'll pray for us. And I'll pray for you as parents. And then we'll close our service today by worshiping. But let's watch this video first, and then we'll take that time to just pray and to sit with what the Lord wants to do. Sorry, Kyle, you only get five minutes to preach today, uh, Sunday. <laughs> Hi, my name is Joel McAllister. This is my wife, Lara. We've been married for almost 25 years, a little bit later on this year. And we have two kids. Alyssa is almost 21 and Connor will be 19 a little bit later on this year. We've been attending Emmanuel for, for 11, about 11 years now. We've never really talked about this in front of a lot of people ever. So uh, this might be, this is a little bit hard for us because uh, it, was, it was a very hard time. Um, Connor is 13 and Joel and I were out shopping one night at I Ikea actually and he called us very upset on a FaceTime call and uh, we we came home and we were just like, what's going on, what's going on? And, and he shared with us that, um, that he wanted to end his life, that he wanted to kill himself. And so as a parent, those are some of the hardest words to ever hear your child say. And so as we talked more about it, it came out that he was being bullied at school and um, a kid at school had just told him, uh, nobody likes you, you should just go home and kill yourself. And so what kept happening was this thought of, of ending his life kept going through his mind, kept looping through his mind. And it's funny as parents to teenagers, I always felt like we were, we were ready for the, the big talks on drugs and parties and alcohol and sex. Like we're ready for those talks. And then, and then our, our kid throws this at us and I, we just felt very unprepared and yeah, it was horrible. It was really horrible and it was hard to find anybody to talk to. Uh, I was searching for counselors, trying to make appointments with our doctors, trying to talk to someone who could, who could help us. And, and it was a challenge. It was really hard. And so I, I finally got in to talk to a counselor and she, she sat with me and she listened and she kind of pointed me in a direction to go, which was very helpful. And so we got into counseling. Um, Connor and I would go together and we tried to pull this apart a little bit. And through this time, it's calling out to God was so, it was so hard, but it was really all, all we had um, to hold on to. In these situations, we want quick fixes and there was not, there was not a quick fix coming. We wanted to wake up the next morning and just have these thoughts out of Connor's mind and they were there probably even more and more so we uh yeah we took as many action steps as we could we um, enrolled Connor in a different school we pulled him out of that situation as quickly as we could and God was very very gracious to get him into a private Christian school when we really thought that there was no chance he would get in Another way God really provided for us was surrounding us with really good, solid friends and family who would pray with us. And we got in to see a child psychiatrist relatively quickly. Um, that, was, that was a huge blessing. This was over the course of three or four months, I guess. And it seemed like an eternity um, when you're living this day in and day out. And yeah, God just every step of the way provided us with the help we needed. Um, our family doctor was very helpful. It was, um, yeah, it was it was hard, and there were some days. I know this sounds really, really sad, but it was it's true. I remember shopping for back to school clothes for him in the summertime, and actually thinking he might not ever wear these clothes. He might not make it. He might not, he might, 
choose to end his life before he even gets into these clothes. And so those were, they were really dark times. And I don't know how people go through these things without God. Yeah, I mean, it's something that Lara said, you never really prepare for that and just how unprepared I think we were and how it forced us uh, to, to lean on God and to, and to draw near to Him um, when we couldn't do it on our own strength. There's nothing else we could do. So mm -hmm. I, my, my natural tendency to try to fix it myself first and uh, there's nothing, nothing you can do. So yeah, just watch God work. It truly has been miraculous how God has worked in Connor's life. Um, if you told me four years ago that he would be in England at a Bible school on his own, thriving, um, learning about God, he wants to be a high school teacher so he can help other kids go through this or, or maybe even a pastor. It's such a miracle that he's where he's at now and it is truly only by the grace of God I would say for anyone going through this or has gone through this or might go through this in the future, keep God at the center. We never stop talking about God. We never stop praying. Listen to your kids, check in with your kids um, often, even if it really annoys them. Yeah, God really moves. God really moves and, and does work miracles. So may this be an encouragement to anyone who's maybe going through this. Um, yeah, there's definitely hope. For sure there's hope. Anybody wants to talk to us about it? <laughs> we're, we're open. We're here to support you and care for you, so. Thanks, Joel and Myra, for sharing that. But, you know, we often come into this place and go through our life in church, and we never really realize what's going on in the life of those around us. And so I just want to invite us into this time again to pray. If you have something heavy on you, pray, call out to God. Hear the words that we just heard, that God answers and he's good and he's faithful. If maybe that's not the place that you're in and things are good or maybe you don't have kids, I just encourage you to intercede on behalf of someone else. Just pray over those families, those kids, those parents who are going through incredibly difficult circumstances. It's an opportunity for us to let God work. So let's just pray. Lord God, it's so easy for us to come to this place and to, Lord, think about ourselves and what's going on in our own lives. But Lord God, it is uh, it's powerful to hear about what goes on in the life of others too. And Lord, sometimes that, that feel of powerfulness is, is thankfulness for what you do. And God, I thank you for what you did in Connor's life. I thank you that he's in Bible school and and that he's thriving and doing well. And God, that he has decided that he wants to give his life to, to helping others who have gone through difficult things. And God, that he wants to serve you. And, but God, while well, that's, that's powerful and we thank you for that, we know that there's also the, the power of the weight of, of the heaviness that grows in some parents' hearts and minds. And God, we know that there's kids, there's kids who are suffering with anxiety and depression. There's kids who are suffering with, with loneliness and isolation. There's kids who are, are suffer, suffering with, with heavy questions. That they just don't have the, the ability to understand. God, we, we recognize that there's parents in this room who for years and sometimes decades have been praying for their kids to come to you. And Lord God, their kids still have not decided to, to have a relationship with you. And Lord, I feel that heaviness in the room. And so God, I ask you, out of your abundant grace, 
out of your good, good mercy, out of your love for us. Lord, would you move? Would we see kids changed and healed of their anxiety, depression, of the different things that plague them mentally and emotionally? God, we, we pray for those who have walls up spiritually, Lord God, that you would tear them down. And Lord God, we know the timing for the fruits in your hands, but Lord God, we would love to see it. I know there's parents who are just dying to see it in their lifetime. And so, Lord God, I ask you to break through. Lord God, I pray that you would meet every parent today where we're at. And Lord God, even though we know we're wrong where we, and that we fail, Lord God, will we hear your good news? That while we might not be enough, you are enough. That you will continue to work through everything that you will continue to work in every situation in every child's life. And Lord God, we give that to you. God, I ask that, that as we try to figure out what a, a good way of living this out uh, looks like in our home, Lord God, would you give wisdom to every parent? Lord, when it's a couple parenting together, would you give them a wisdom together so they'd be unified on knowing what to do for, for the parents who are our single parenting, Lord God, that you would just give them wisdom that goes beyond measure too. Lord God, I pray for all the aunties and uncles and grandmas and grandpas as well. Lord God, that you would help them to live out the gospel in the lives of those kids who are around them. Whether they're friends' kids or their own kids or their own grandkids or somebody else's grandkids too, Lord God, we just pray that you would use every person in this church to help strengthen the families that are not just here, but are in our community. We pray that more and more people would come to love you, Jesus, and that that would be transformed by the outworking of a people who are living their lives on fire for you. So Holy Spirit, help us to love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all our mind, and help us to raise our kids to do it too. Now, Lord, as we, we sing this next song, God, I just pray that you would be praised for those who are struggling maybe to sing the words in the next few moments, Lord, that the voices of others around them would just minister to them, that it would just be a time of great encouragement, that it would be a time of hearing the truth of who you are and what only you can do. So, Lord God, as we praise you, would you get some of the praise you deserve and would you use this as an opportunity to minister in a way only you can do. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.